Good morning, uh, and um, on behalf of the Design Alliance Asia, of which I'm the founder and chairman, uh, would like to extend my deepest appreciation for inviting me to speak to you for about 15 minutes on one of our key projects, uh, really a research on colours. And I hope that, well, uh, every one of you in the printing industry who works with colour, maybe hope to give you a slightly different perspective on the on the meaning and significance of colours, particularly in the Asian context. Our organisation, just a little, give you a little background, um, um, was founded in 2000 and we uh, are represented in 13 Asian countries and regions. And we basically have a shared vision of to advance Asian identity as a vital cultural force and as a strategic platform for design. Uh, we hope to promote the original creativity of Asian designers, students, entrepreneurs by sharing ideas and knowledge of our common cultures uh, throughout Asia. Colors of Asia is a research exhibition project um, which was fully funded by the Hong Kong government. Uh, we, it, it is actually part of our initiative to uncover what is the essence of Asia in the broad field of design. We're talking about, for Asians, what is our way of thinking and doing? Uh, what are our cultural and spiritual affinities, our aesthetics, our philosophy, our innovations, both modern and ancient? And how can we give this knowledge relevance in, con in the contemporary world, in contemporary design? For this project, we have, uh, among our organization, uh, each of us submitted about 3,200 uh, ideas about colors in Asia, and, and we went through a whole research. Uh, the research paper is actually 1,000 page, of which two pages are in, printed in, your, in this program book, which is in a goodie bag. Uh, it's just a very small research on how uh, designers observe the use of green, uh, especially uh, catering for a Malay uh, Muslim uh, market in Malaysia. But that's just about two pages of 1,000 pages <laughs> of a very extensive research throughout, throughout uh, Asia. Um, next. Colour, however, really has no meaning. You know, colour cannot be touched. You can't smell colour, you can't taste colour. Colour has no sound, you can't hear colour. Yet, when light of a wavelength of 650 nanometers, which is the wavelength for the colour red, reaches our brain, our body stiffens because red is the colour of danger. Or our body will soften because red is the colour of love. Or we become very angry because red is the colour of revolution. So, and colour not only affects us psychologically, but also physio physiologically. Because red, when you, when you encounter red, uh, your muscle tone increases, your blood pressure increases, and your rate of breathing also increases. In other words, red even affects blind people who cannot see the colour red but can feel the colour red because it is physiological. And the conclusion, or really the accepted uh, understanding of colour is really colour is about energy. Colour is energy. These are some of the thousands of, us, uh, of interesting ideas about colours in Asia which we went through. Next. Next. Okay. Now, colour, uh, as I said earlier, has no meaning. It acquires its meaning only within the context of culture, of history, of geography, of language. Some meanings are universal. For example, the United Nations chose blue sky for their identity because it is considered non-aggressive and it is neutral. All nations on earth share the same blue sky. I have a lot of days in China. <laughs> Whenever I go to China, I don't see blue skies. 
the meaning of colors change from society to society. And it changed with time. For example, uh, in the Middle Ages, in aristocratic Europe, the bride in a wedding wears a red wedding gown. This is in Europe. Until the 18th century, when the idea of white as a symbol of purity became very popular. So the wedding gown in Europe changed from red to white. In fact, today, a bride wearing a red wedding gown in Europe would be quite a shocking sight to her guests. <laughs> um, in China, uh, China it's interesting because uh, part of this research, we also did a whole study on uh, the China red. And we were comparing, is there a difference between the red in China, the red in Hong Kong, and the red in Taiwan? Now, it may be surprising to most people who are not familiar with the history of China that China wasn't a very popular color until the Ming Dynasty. You see, the, the Chinese conceive of the world composing of five elements. Okay, green for wood, red for fire, yellow for earth, white for metal, black for water. During the Chao, Zhao Dynasty, they feel their symbol is really fire, and therefore the popular color, or rather the color worn by the imperial palace uh, uh, soldiers and, and uh, government was red. But when the Qin society, uh, Qin dynasty overtook the Zhao dynasty, their color was black, the symbol of water. So black became the color of China. And then when the Han dynasty came, they were, they were the symbol of the earth. Yellow became the color of China. And when Ming Dynasty came in, red became back the color of the imperial. And, and I think throughout history, I think since the Ming Dynasty through the communist era and through, uh, and I think because there was a lot of red uh, in, in those decades, it became internationally associated. Uh, the color became internationally associated with China. So color really changed through time and changed also through society. And um, color dyes and pigments, of course, were traded from ancient times and connected far away Asian societies through the Silk Road and the sea routes, the maritime Silk Road. In fact, the finest blue and white Ming Dynasty ceramics depended on the supply of cobalt blue from Persia, the Middle East. And where it wasn't available, the ceramics can be more accurately described as blue-gray rather than uh, the, the blue and white of the Ming Dynasty. Even today, you can see uh, there's vast differences in color uh, geogra in geographical regions. Now, the monks wrote, I think the, the, the idea of saffron or orange, uh, according to our research, and this was based on old Buddhist manuscript, um, I think when Gautama Buddha uh, was meditating, he saw um, soldiers leading prisoners. And the prisoners were wearing orange, uh, orange suit, much like today. I mean, orange is also used in many uh, prisons. And the Buddha thought that although these people have committed a crime, they're still human beings and we should, uh, we should see them as fellow human beings. And he, he thought that maybe saffron uh, would tie humanity together, and therefore he adopted, uh, according to the ancient manuscripts, uh, saffron or orange as the symbol of, uh, as a symbolic color of Buddhism. But if you notice the monks' robe in various Asian countries, they are all of different shades. Uh, brown in Hong Kong, uh, Thailand is saffron, and you get various shades. Now, how these different shades come about is really because where the monks are, the color was derived from the dye of the plant. And this is most obvious in Lang Prabang, where you got the city monks and the forest monks. The city monks are saffron, but the forest monks, because the plant gave them a more brownish tone, wore brown robes. Uh, nowadays, of course, uh, most colors are uh, dyed synthetically. In fact, in Thailand, Thailand actually is the main exporter of monks' robes to, to Hong Kong, to uh, Laos, to Burma, and so on. But, but using synthetic dye, they still follow the traditional plant dyes. So, I mean, they were quite smart in, uh, in, in 
uh, in investigating the local color preferences and, ex and, uh, and designing the manufacturing process to produce this color to export to each of the different countries. The slide is a bit dark, but uh, in our exhibition in Hong Kong, uh, we put up this display uh, which faces the front entrance. It is actually, sorry, uh, just stay at the slide. Um, it is actually the Do It, uh, Do It Raya, which is the green, uh, green packet which uh, people give to children during, the, um, during Hari Raya, which is the very important uh, Muslim uh, celebration and holiday. Um, we found that the most interesting uh, Do It Raya packet, the green packet, uh, in terms of design and colour and amazing printing technology really comes from Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, my Indonesian associate that in Indonesia it is a trend which is just beginning to happen because they still give the traditional all green packet without any design. But of course, uh, they are being influenced also by Malaysia, Singapore. And of course, I think you can see interesting decorations on green packets in uh, in the more major cities of Indonesia. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, facing the front entrance, I hung some of the most amazing green packets I found in Malaysia. And of course, uh, true to the spirit of the festive, I did some fairy lights around this structure. So when you walk past the entrance of this exhibition hall, you see this twinkling fairy lights that drew a lot of people in. Surprisingly, this particular exhibit was reported in all the Hong Kong newspapers and magazines. And it was one of the most talked about items in Hong Kong where the exhibition was held among the local Hong Kong people because they could never imagine that the red ampau can also be green. <laughs> <laughs> and to us, it was actually a shock. I said that, I mean, it's so common to us, but how other cultures see you and your use of color could be equally surprising. And of course, I mean, this research was also done um, not only for design students and designers, but also for entrepreneurs when they want to export the products to different countries. We, 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 uh, we, we did a workshop in Taiwan where uh, we brought the Taiwanese students together. And most of these Taiwanese students have never been out of the country. They are so Taiwanese, Chinese. Okay, so I brought my associate from Vietnam and from Indonesia to do a workshop. Okay, the student's task was to design a traditional Vietnamese packaging of cookies, which is always in red and gold. Okay, how do you redesign this traditional cookie? Uh, in, in Vietnam, almost all, everything is in red and gold. <laughs> it's nothing unusual. How do you, con how do you interpret this traditional Vietnamese cookie and export it to an Islamic country like Indonesia. And that was a real challenge. But, but interestingly, we gave them a sense of the culture, the Islamic culture, the sense of the, the various things. And surprisingly, the students actually did quite well. All they need was the basic, the right knowledge to be able to, uh, to, try to interpret the colors and to be uh, to connect with the community and the people and the consumers in each country to be successful. And basically, we, uh, a lot of work is actually based on this cross-cultural interaction. Indonesia is wonderful because this is the wedding certificate. Okay? It's the Buku Nika Swami and the Buku Nika Isri. Now, what's, what's interesting about this marriage certificate is that they do not follow the Western con uh, Convention of blue for male and red or pink or red for female. Okay, they follow the traditional uh, color concept of, of Indonesia where uh, the male is red and the, uh, and the female is green, green for purity and so I mean it goes deep. So each of our Asian society has very specific ideas about uh, colors. No doubt a lot of them have been converted to Asian ideas about colors, particularly our toilet signs. And you can find this, uh, this, uh, this interpretation in many other areas as well. Um, Thailand is wonderful because um, there's a color for every day. Okay. Um, 
Sunday is red, Monday is yellow, and so and so on. Um, and leave aside very fashionable metropolitan Bangkok where, uh, where people follow fashion trends uh, uh, quite closely. But if you go to other parts of Thailand, people actually wear according to the colours of the day. Uh, there's, a, there's a very famous uh, cultural critic, uh, and he, was, he made a very interesting comment. He said that he's living in uh, modern Bangkok. So when I go to my office, which is in this very modern tower, and I step into the office and I look around, I know it is Friday blue, because everybody has some blue things, either a shirt or a necktie or a handkerchief. There's something blue in it. Now, this is so much embedded in the Thai psyche because from small children, they always brought up with a sing-along song, Sunday is uh, red, uh, Monday is yellow, and so on. So it's very much in the psychology of the Thais, and the Thais are very colourful people. But this has a basis because the, the colours is based on very ancient Hindu uh, astro astronomy. It is actually the colours of the planet and how planet affects uh, our mood, our uh, way we feel for ourselves every day has something to do with colours. Next slide. Uh, India, of course, uh, this is how they celebrate uh, the birth anniversary of, uh, of uh, the most famous icon, um, Gandhi. And of course the white, I think it's called the uh, Kadi, Cloth, uh, of course, white represents uh, in Gandhi's struggle. White represents purity. It represents simplicity. It represents truth. And this is basically how uh, uh, each year, I think, children dress as mini Gandhis <laughs> to celebrate and to promote this idea. And of course, uh, earlier it was also a sign of protest uh, for equal rights and for democracy. And of course, India has. Next slide. Uh, wonderful ways of celebrating festivals. This is uh, Tiger Day. <laughs> uh, 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 truly wonderful. Next slide. And um, so, in exhibition, we explore colours. Like this is um, this is really three tables where we assembled objects from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, and from China. And from Taiwan, you can clearly see that the Taiwan red is not the Chinese red. Uh, it's actually a peach red, and I think uh, about five or eight years ago, it has been documented by the government of Taiwan as the official red colour of Taiwan. It is a peach red, which is based on some of the things, uh, some of the cakes, uh, some of the things which have been in Taiwan uh, traditionally for a long time. Uh, there is actually not that much difference between Hong Kong and China uh, from the things we, uh, both really uh, almost what the world would uh, classify as Chinese red. Next slide. And so, uh, so we had our exhibition, and of course it was part of, uh, besides the exhibition, uh, we had a symposium uh, for, uh, for students, we had forum among the professionals, we had lectures for the public, and really we're talking about colours, how colour uh, is so important to us in kind of a globalised world. Colour is really an unspoken language whose roots lie very deep in our culture and in our history. We use colour to define who we are and our place in the world. So if colour is so fundamental for a culture to describe itself, its identity, then the more this colour language is used, the more enduring the culture becomes. And that is a very interesting concept uh, in terms of globalization and localization. So ultimately, our research about Colors of Asia is a story about really ourselves, our identity, and the human experience. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I have to rush for a presentation after lunch and not able to take any questions, but you can always email to me. <laughs> Uh, like I said, that we have actually um, about 1,000 pages of research, which is currently with the Hong Kong government. They are supposed to release this information on the website uh, soon, but 
not quite sure what's the date. And, um, and I see the colour as a very important way for us to, like I mentioned in the, my concluding statement, how we define ourselves uh, and how we define our nation, how we define our community. Thank you.